Thank you, praise team. Uh, it's an honor today to be able to introduce the guest speaker. Um, I met JT, I guess, five years ago. Uh, of all places, it was on a football field. I don't know if you remember this. Uh, he was actually umpiring a foot. I'm sorry, the children's worship. He was actually um, referee in a football game. And what caught my attention more than anything was his accent. You know, and I was like, who is this guy? But anyway, later on, uh, I met him at the gym, early morning workouts and stuff like that. And I really got to know him. And I can tell you, everything he says is the truth. Uh, he actually honors God's word. Uh, he was a teacher. I think he's been in the Army, and he's trying to do a lot of, a lot of things. And wherever he goes, he always uh, brings happiness, as I can say. His wife, Lori, works at Brown's. Uh, here, she's been there four or five years, I'm assuming. But um, they're just good people, you know. Every time I see him, he's always got this energy about him, and it's because of what God is doing in his life. So right now, I'm not going to take any more time up with Mr. J.T. Hopkins. So can you hear me? Okay. I don't know that I really need this, but uh, maybe it'll help relieve a little bit. So if you will, if you've got your Bible with you, if you will, if you, if you can, please stand with me as we open the Word of the Lord and we read today's passage. And it'll be from that passage that we'll be preaching from today. And it's a familiar passage. It's Genesis chapter 22. It's the sacrifice of Isaac. So pretty familiar passage here. And I'll be reading from the ESV translation. So here we go. The word of the Lord reads, After these things God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. He said, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains in which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. And then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they went both of them together. And Isaac said to his father Abraham, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. He said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them, together. When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. He said, Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing that you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the pl name of that place the Lord will provide as it, is in, as it is said to this day on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and he said, 
By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gates of his enemies and in your offspring shall all the names of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men and they arose and went together to Beersheba and Abraham lived at Beersheba. May the Lord bless the preaching and teaching of his holy word. You may be seated. So I've, I've titled today's sermon, A Faithful God Provides for His Promise. And I pray that we walk away today with a greater trust and a greater faith that God will continue to provide for His promise. Now at the onset of today's passage, Moses uses the phrase, after these things not to point to the immediate context surrounding the passage, but to point to the broad narrative, the entire life of Abraham. And these are significant words, because the life of Abraham, which begins, the narrative begins in Genesis 12, it really points to God's providence, and after these things Moses writes, pointing back to, see, to where we see the foundation of all this being set in God's providence and, and, and what we would understand gives Abraham the faith to move forward with today. It is in Genesis 12 that the Lord makes a promise to Abraham. And that promise will serve as the foundation of this discussion today. The Lord promised to make Abraham into a great nation. That Abraham's offspring would bless all the nations and that it would take the land. And this promise is repeated in at least four variations from Genesis 12 until our passage today. From leaving his father's homeland to being a nomad much of his life, to the trials with the famine in the land, to losing his wife Sarah twice in Egypt and Gerar, to fathering Ishmael with Hagar, to rescuing his uncle Lot from captivity, finally receiving the promised offspring in Isaac. Abraham's life is marked by numerous tests that challenge his trust in the Lord. Still, we see the sovereignty of the Lord to sustain Abraham, whether it's blessing his obedience or keeping him when he tries to get ahead of the Lord, when he tries to do it on his own plans, God is sovereign and he sustains. Furthermore, by the time we get to Genesis chapter 22, now we see a matured Abraham growing in the Lord and learning that the Lord will provide for his promise. This is a vital lesson for us to learn today. To patiently trust in the God's promise, in God's promise. Beloved, we are so blessed today. Whereas Abraham had an occasional message from the Lord, we have God's complete and authoritative word. Whereas Abraham came to faith with mere shadows of the gospel, we have the full gospel of Jesus Christ. Whereas initially Abraham had little evidence of the Lord's faithfulness, we have almost 2,000 years of church history. Yet sadly today, 
instead of trusting the authority and the Word of God's Scripture, of His promises, with faithful men preaching the Word, administering the ordinary means of grace, and trusting that God will provide the everlasting church growth. Many churches and denominations permit the culture, feelings, and pragmatism to dictate their actions. And that's why we have cowardly men posing as shepherds, feeding their congregations junk food every Sunday, we have church services that look more like a circus. And we have feminist, sinful women usurping the authority of man. All this to appease the feelings of people, to attract and entertain people with carnal means. The gravest sin of the American church, beloved, is that she has failed to trust in a faithful God that provides for His promises. However, in time, Christ the Lord will destroy the worship of the wicked. And He will provide and raise up like He always does God-fearing believers that he will use as instruments to fulfill his promise of seeing the gospel spread. Now we see Abraham coming to the end of his life. We don't read about Abraham receiving a nice retirement pension to go sit on his porch in comfort and just watch the rest of his days go by. But there's always much work to be done for the Lord and His kingdom. And believers do not merely retire. Now in his old age, God calls Abraham to his most grueling, heart-churning test of all his life. In the, in the King James translation, it reads that God tempted Abraham. Now, we know that God does not tempt to sin, and the Hebrew language here would suggest that it does not mean enticed to do wrong. So why does God do this? Why does God test his children? Why does God not just leave this poor old Abraham alone? Well, because the refiner's fire is always burning away remaining sin and making his children dependent on him. For when one is saved by faith, by grace, through faith in Christ alone, we are enlisted in the discipleship of the Holy Spirit. And in the process of sanctification, through testing, God graciously shapes His believers into the likeness of His Son, all for the purpose of glorifying Himself. Therefore, testing is good. The book of James delivers an appropriate response. Count it all a joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kind, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Overall, the Lord provides testing to equip His church to graciously be used as instruments to fulfill His promises. Still, in verse 1, the Lord thunders down, Abraham! And immediately, as an obedient servant, Abraham, Abraham replies, Here I am. The following command from the Lord initially had to wound the very soul of Abraham. You see, Isaac holds the promise. Isaac is the son in which God's covenant is supposed to work through. 
Isaac is the son that all the nations are supposed to be blessed. Isaac is the son through which Abraham will be made into a great nation. Lord, why not choose Ishmael for this sacrifice? Well, Ishmael's been disinherited already. God did not choose Ishmael. So the Lord tells Abraham to take his only son, whom he loves, and to travel three days, prolonging the agony, and to not only kill him immediately, but to offer him up as a burnt offering. Now, now burnt offerings, at this time during Abraham's culture, it's, it's common, it's, it's a common practice, but we don't get the clarification of what a burnt offering is until Leviticus. And in Leviticus chapter 1, it explains the purpose and the procedure of a burnt offering. The purpose, a burnt offering, is to temporarily atone for the sin of man. The procedure, the sacrifice needed to be cut and bled out. The blood of the sacrifice needed to be covered over the altar for the atonement of sins, signifying that the blood of life is that atoning part. Then, the sacrifice's body needed to be cut up into small pieces and burnt as a burnt offering. This is what Abraham is commanded to do by the Lord. Now from our perspective, it seems a bit contradictory. Whereas the Lord commanded Abraham, leave your father's homeland, I'm going to make a great nation of you, and eventually promises Isaac, now the Lord is telling Abraham, leave your wife and go murder your son Isaac. And we also know that murder is against God's moral law. So it's a bit confusing. But listen, what we see with our human eyes as possibly contradictory, what we might even see as evil, the sovereignty of the Lord has a greater view and purpose. He has decreed all things before the foundation of the world. And in His great providence, He works all things together for the good of those that He has called according to His purpose. In this passage, we don't get just the benefit of seeing the firm faith of a godly man we get to see the shadow of a future sacrifice that will reveal the greatest depth that man can fathom, greatest depth of love. We see a shadow of how a faithful God will provide for His promise despite the physical circumstances. Now that the Lord has spoken, and gave Abraham's command, we see Abraham's faithful response. Abraham does not hesitate. Abraham does not try to negotiate. And he does not try to manipulate the Lord's command. Whereas today, if we were given this command, our response might be, Lord, we don't have time today. The son has football practice. Or one of my favorite ones that we like to use. You know that sacrificing business, Lord? That, that was cultural. I'm more evolved, more advanced... to obey that command. The Prince of Preachers, Charles Spurgeon, writes in his commentary on Genesis chapter 22, Obedience should be prompt. We should not, we should, we should show 
our willingness to obey the Lord's commands by not delaying. Abraham rose up early in the morning. All the details mentioned for true obedience is very careful of detail. They who would serve God aright must serve Him faithfully in little things as well as great ones. There must be a saddling of the donkey, a calling of the two young men as well as Isaac, and a cleaving of the wood for the burnt offering. We must do everything that is included in the bounds of the divine command and do it all with scrupulous exactness and care. Indifferent obedience to God's command is practically disobedience. Careless obedience is dead obedience. The heart has gone out of it. Moving forward, we read not only do Abraham's actions reveal his faith in the Lord, but his words also reveal his actions. For we know by, again, reference in James that faith without works is dead. It's the faith that comes first to the Catholic brothers and sisters. In verse 5, Abraham tells the two men he brought with him and Isaac, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. From the beginning of this three-day journey, Abraham already knows that he and the boy Isaac will be returning home. Then on the mount, when Isaac asked about the lamb for the burnt offering, Abraham responds, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. After 100 plus years of life, Abraham trusted God to provide, carry out his promise, despite his own human inclinations. The writer of Hebrews tells us, chapter 11, verses 17 through 19, by faith, when he was tested, offered by faith Abraham when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. And just like all the heroes of the Christian faith, from these in Scripture like Abraham, to the early church fathers, to the reformers, to the Puritans, we must submit to God and learn to trust and obey God, for He alone is faithful and He alone will provide. Furthermore, it is also important to mention Isaac's obedience. Now, I don't know the exact age, scholarship, kind of points that Isaac would have been in his early to mid-twenties at this time. Of course, that makes Abraham, I mean, if Abraham has Isaac around 100, he's, he's on up there. Isaac was of the age that he could have wrestled he could have overpowered his father easily. But Isaac trusts the Lord, submits to the authority of his own father on in, in, uh, submits to the authority of his father in heaven and on earth. He willingly offers his life as a sacrifice. And I want you to notice also. Again, neither Abraham nor Isaac succumbs to sinful temptation of the wicked one. 
that might have been whispering like he did to Eve in the garden. Did God actually say? No. Abraham and Isaac obeyed. And as Abraham raised the knife to bear it into his only son, whom he loved, the angel of the Lord said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, in what I could imagine, tears and heartache, Here I am. Do not lay your hands on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God. Seeing you have not withheld your only son. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, Behind him was a ram, caught in a thicket by his horns. And any of us that have been in the woods, who have been hunters, or have been around wild animals, period, you know that that ram didn't just wander up to two men. For most wild animals are in fear of man. So, this, this ram was here the entire time. Now, it may have ran in fear, and, and that's how it gets caught in the thicket. But in the heat of the moment, in the heat of the battle, in the heat of the testing, Abraham couldn't see. Just like Abraham... We need to learn through our trials and through our testing. Not only is the Lord going to provide and pull us out of it, but some, sometimes His provision is right there before our eyes. And in this moment, Abraham witnessed once again the overwhelming grace and provision of the Lord. For in this moment, when Abraham saw that ram, he saw substitution. And this is the very first scriptural reference to a substitutionary atonement. For it was not going to have to be Isaac on this day. For it was not going to have to be you. For it was not going to have to be me. For there was a ram... On this day, for us, it was a lamb. For every trial, for every word, for every action, the Lord will provide. And this final test that we read in Abraham's account reveals his faith and his full dependence on the Lord. For you will obey the one you fear. Now listen, today's passage isn't just about Abraham and Isaac. It's not really about them at all. Yes, it is a beautiful illustration of a man's faith, an unwavering faith, and full dependence on God. But this passage is about a faithful God and a gracious God that despite Abraham's obedience or his disobedience would fulfill his promise to Abraham and to his elect to bring forth an offspring that will crush the head of the serpent and to make a great nation. And approximately 2,000 years after Abraham's account, in approximately 2,000 years from today, that offspring was born to a virgin as God's only son, a son whom he loved 
And he placed him on a donkey, brought him to where he would be sacrificed, placed the wood on his back, laid him upon the altar, and the father slaughtered his son as the final lamb, as the substitutionary atonement that he provided for the sin of those that he chose before the foundation of the world to be his own. And all this so that we may stand redeemed before him, a holy and righteous Lord, that we may glorify and live with him eternally. Not today. If you do not believe, I call you to repent of your sinful life. To believe in the Lord Jesus Christ without delay. Lastly, church, for encouragement. Despite the chaos, the heartbreak that this world offers, we serve a faithful God that still provides for His promise. If you've got your... My hand stuck to my Bible. If you've got your Bible, turn with me. Same passage, Genesis chapter 22, verses 17 and 18. This is, this is the last part of that passage we discussed. The angel of the Lord tells Abraham, I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. In Galatians chapter 3, Paul explains that this promise is the gospel given to Abraham. And he was counted righteous through faith as he looked forward to the offspring and blessing. Today, we are blessed and counted righteous through faith in Christ, the promised offspring of Abraham that he looked forward to. And whereas we could end today's service and proclaim praise be to God for His faithfulness, His provision, and His salvation offered in Christ, there are more promises and blessings to unfold. Christ will save more. Christ's church will multiply as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. Christ's church will possess the gates of its enemies. And all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Why? Because Christ explained to Peter, that he will build his church on the rock that proclaims Christ as the Son of the living God, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And in Christ's great commission to all his followers, he proclaimed all authority in heaven and on earth. That's the part we forget to read about. We want to live in our box thinking as the Lord is a spiritual being 
and that we're just going to be okay. But Christ says, all authority on earth, everything we see, experience, run through, is under the authority of God. It's all been given to Him by the Lord His Father. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of this this age. Christ's church will grow and prevail because a faithful God will always provide for His promise. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we look to this passage today to to see how you alone provided for Abraham. For his faith, you gave to him many years before. And through his life, you tested him, you matured him into a mature believer, Lord so that he was even willing to sacrifice the son he loved. And then we continue through Scripture, Lord, of all the blessings you've given us, all the many covenants, promises that you give to your children. And we know that you will fulfill those promises. In due time, Lord, for every word breathed from you, Genesis to Revelation, are words from you, and they're authoritative, and it will all be acted out through your sovereignty. God, in our lives, you've tested us when the storms came and maybe we didn't obey, you still brought us through the storms. You were so faithful even in our disobedience with your grace and your love. While we were sinners, you still loved us. And we know that the offspring that Abraham looked forward to was sacrificed. And the offspring that we look back on was sacrificed. The king slayed the dragon on that day. And Jesus Christ burst through the tomb three days later as our risen Savior and Lord For that, Lord, we are so grateful. God, because you could have just let us go. Let us go on our wayward wayward path. But you didn't let us, Lord. So we stand here today to worship you, to glorify you, and to honor you. And I pray this message has done that. Lord, I pray that you have worked in the hearts of your believers in this church, that you've given them encouragement, that you've grown their faith, that you're going to give them boldness and and, and encourage to move forward with their lives to glorify you and only you, Lord. God, and if there's a believer, a non-believer in this place today, God, don't let them hesitate, Lord. Don't let them them be in disobedience, Lord. If you call them today, God, have them submit to you, Lord. Repent and believe. God, you work all things things for the good of those that you've called. We don't know which direction you're going to carry us, but Lord, it does not matter because we know that you will fulfill and provide for your promise, promise, for you alone are faithful 
perfect and holy. Bless us, Lord. It's in Christ's holy, powerful name we pray. Amen.